Hello, math friends. It's your friendly professor, Nate Allen here, going over section 4.1 in our text titled Linear Functions. In other words, lines. And you may be wondering, hey, I'm in college algebra. I'm in pre-calculus level. Why am I going over lines? Well, these are very, very important for us in a multitude of ways. And so we're just going to hit on that rehash some of the things we already know, and then try to see how we can use this for a calculus level understanding and comprehension. So uh, you can see here a few definitions, few things, again, stuff you should know. I'll highlight those real quick, run over them, and then try to elaborate on the newer ways that we can think about linear functions, okay? So our most familiar, and probably what everyone remembers is, y equals mx plus b, or what we call slope-intercept form. Slope, because in the order that we list these things, that is the m and the intercept, namely the y-intercept, is the letter b. So if you remember the y-intercept, the way that we find intercepts is by letting the other letter equal zero and solving for the one that we want. So if we want to know what the y-intercept is, we let x be 0. And it doesn't matter what our slope is. If x is 0, that whole thing goes to 0. So we get that our y is equal to whatever this number is out here, positive or negative b. OK? So what we're going to talk about is slope in a lot more detail, all right, and try to elaborate on instead of just x's and y's on our axes, and whether it's an increasing from left to right, our y values are going up, getting larger, or from left to right, as our x's increase, our y's are decreasing, getting smaller. And every once in a while, they flatline. They stay the same. We call that a constant function. We're going to try to take that away from the X's and Y's and look about real world situations. How can we apply this stuff in a different way? So we know increasing and decreasing functions all depend on the slope. And if that slope is positive, then so is your function. Negative then so is your function. And if it's zero, meaning that it's not there and you just have y equals some number, then you go up to where y is equal to that number. And that's the only values that y will ever yield, no matter what your x is, positive or negative. Okay? So again, things that we should already know, but just rehash and making sure that we remember that. Well, then if slope is so important, how do we calculate it? Well, hopefully you remember it's the rise over the run or the change in our y's over the change in our x's. And how we measure change is by the difference of our two y's and two x values for our two points that we're trying to find the slope of. Okay. Now, what we're going to do in calculus and from here on out, is not just talk about slope as the slope of a line or a mountain if you're a ski or snowboarder. We're going to talk about it as being what we're going to call a rate of change. At what rate are my y's and x changing regularly? Okay. And again, we can talk about them doing that from this point to this point in a positive manner in a negative manner, or a constant manner, not changing at all, right? And it doesn't matter how many points you look at, it would be the exact same step to go up and over, up and over, or down and over. Again, no matter how many extra points that we look at, those should be the same. Rate of change, we're going to call it from now on. Okay? Now, 
I'm going to throw in one more word on there because it's not just the rate of change over an entire interval or two points. It's actually going to be what is represented by the average rate of change. And again, as you can see, I put here, slope is one of the key concepts in first semester calculus. So I know it seems very basic that we're going over lines again and slope in slope intercept form, but let me, let me show you what I mean. If we were to calculate a rate of change or slope, let's say I started at one place, say my house, and we'll call that the point zero, zero, right? And then I traveled to work. here at Fresno City College, right? Now, I actually rode my bike to get there. Are you impressed? Well, some of you are like, yeah, I, I don't know how to ride a bike, so. <laughs> no, but you shouldn't be impressed that I rode my bike from my house to Fresno City because you don't know where I live. Well, you better not. but. You don't know how far that distance is that I traveled, nor do you know how long it took me to get there. <clears throat> Excuse me. So if I told you, for example, that I actually live 30 miles away, but it only took me two hours to get there, now you can make your judgment on whether or not you're impressed by my bike riding skills, okay? So again, you can see that I've set up two points here, whether it's home and work or whatever it might be that we're talking about, okay? Whether there's slope to this or not, I'm looking at the rate of change. So it's not always where it's gonna be a positive or a negative visual. It could be with distance and time. And if you notice, if I said that this is where I started at time zero, mile zero, then I could say over here, then this was two comma 30. And now I have two points. And if you remember, the way that we find this rate of change or slope is the difference in our y values, which we like to usually take the bigger one and start with that so that we can get positive values. So I'm going to call this my X and my Y. This is also an X and a Y. And I'm going to call this my first point and this my second. <clears throat> so again, these are called subscripts. Okay, down below, just for naming purposes, when we have more than one of a particular letter, variable, whatever you want to call it. So I know the slope of this would be the difference in my y values over the difference in my x values. And again, the order doesn't really matter. If you were to start at the bottom of a hill or mountain and go to the top, it doesn't matter if you start here or there, the slope of this thing is going to be the same. It'll just be rise over run or rise over run a different way. The slope of the mountain will not have changed. So for this, I'm going to go ahead and, like I mentioned before, try to plug in things that will give me positive values. So I'm going to start with the Y2 and then subtract the Y1. And then I will do consistently, since I started with the Y2 first, I'm going to do the X2 and then subtract the X1, again being consistent. So that then gives me 30 divided by 2, which I can simplify to be. 15 over 1, or just 15. Now remember, we're not just talking x's and y's, we're talking miles and hours. And so if I put in my measurements, my units, I will end up with, on top, 30 miles is what I traveled in two hours, which I can then simplify that to be 15 miles in one hour, or what we like to abbreviate, 15 miles per hour. 
That, my friends, is what would be called the rate of change that I traveled from home to work. But remember, that doesn't mean I jumped on my bike and immediately started going 15 miles an hour all the way until I got to work and er, stopped. No, remember, this is the average rate of change that I traveled in that distance and that time. So they actually have toll booths set up around the country, around the world, and they know the distance from one toll booth to the other. They also know the speed limit within that. And therefore, they can simply calculate that when you went through one and you got to the other, if you got there too quickly, then what does that mean you had to do? In that average rate of change or speed, you had to go over the speed limit, which means not only will they take the toll to get through, they'll also charge you for speeding. Okay, so some cool applications of this. Wanted to make sure that you guys understand how we will use this. And again, we will expand even more when we get to Calc 1. Okay, but for now, we'll leave it as the average rate of change. And we will continue to use the same format that we've used since early on in our math careers in algebra. Probably seventh grade for many of you. Change in our Ys over the change in our x's. And the way that we denote that is the Greek letter delta. Okay, this is like a lowercase d in the Greek letter alphabet. Okay. So the next thing I wanted to get to was a little thing called point slope form. Because what we're going to be doing in calculus is using this quite frequently. Meaning we need to know a point and a slope. So how are we going to write this down? Well, I'm going to actually derive it for you. Okay. And hopefully you remember what it is. But if not, let me prove it to you. We know slope is when we have two points and we find the difference in our y's over the difference in our x's. Rise to our y's, run from our x's. No, just me. <laughs> so if I have that, remember this is called point slope form. So I definitely have the slope, but now I don't need the second point. So what I'm going to do is simply just get rid of that second point, which means now we just have one point and a slope. And of course, this is a linear which means we're going to have an x and a y to the first power, just like in our other form, y equals mx plus b, x and y to the first power, linear in this equation. But what I don't like about this, even though now I've got a point and a slope, is the fact that there's fractions. So you know that this symbol means to divide. All we have to therefore do then is multiply. And since it's an equation, I'd have to do it to both sides to keep it equal. And I now know that when I do that, the anything, since we're multiplying, divided by itself becomes a 1. And now I'm left with, on one side, y minus y1. And on the other side of my equal sign, my slope times the x minus x1. And that is a much cleaner form because there are no more fractions. So this, my friends, is what is called the point slope form of a linear equation. So when you are given a point and a slope, you can plug in those values and then take the slope and distribute it through, add over that y value, so that you simplify to get it back into that form that we prefer, that slope intercept form that we can look at and graph immediately. But 
Most often, it's better to use this form and get it into this form than simply using a point, some x and some y, and the slope to find b. And then once you find b, rewrite it back into this form. I think it's easier to just use this, manipulate it, and get it back into my slope-intercept form. Okay, so these are the two equations that we will utilize throughout our conversations in dealings with lines, but in calculus, it's really, really nice to use this one over that one because this will be something that we utilize much differently in calc. Okay, we'll be finding what is called the slope of a tangent. And in order to do that, we'll be using a derivative. And we usually want to find it at a specific point. So again, our point slope form, but how we use slope will be a little bit different in calc. So there's a few other things I just wanted to touch on real quick, and that's when we have multiple lines. We'll talk about parallel and perpendicular and special lines. When we have a horizontal line or a vertical line. So hopefully you remember, if we were to graph either one of those things, a horizontal line would look a little something like this, and a vertical line a little something like this. And if I wanted the equation for those things, then you should be able to tell me that a horizontal line is where my y values are all the same for any x value. So the only thing that really matters, since you can put in any x, is only the y value. It's going to be equal to some number they're calling b. Then what about the vertical line? Vertical line, a little bit different. Notice they're writing it instead of y equals some number, they're writing f of x. Because remember we talked about a function has to pass the vertical line test. Well, if it's a vertical line, it's definitely not gonna pass. It fails miserably. This only hits one place, one place, one place, one place. So for every x that we input, we got out one we call output. In particular, they were all the same y value. Okay, but for here, that means I can now have any y value, but only one x. So we will say x has to equal some number, any number. Okay, well then, what about when we add in multiple lines? Okay, we're gonna look at their slopes. Just like I told you at the beginning, very, very important concept. Parallel lines means, hopefully you remember this as well, that their slopes have to be the same. Okay, now you gotta be careful. You gotta make sure that the two y-intercepts are also not the same. Because if I had this and that, and they were both horizontal, then obviously they have the same slope, a slope of zero, by the way. No change like we talked about. And their y-intercepts are different. Because if they were both a slope of zero, meaning horizontal, but their y-intercepts were the same, then that actually means they're the same line. And by definition, parallel means that they never intersect. Those would intersect everywhere. Again, fails miserably. So make sure that you know that the lines are not the same. Just because their slopes are the same doesn't mean they're parallel. You have to make sure that their y-intercepts are also not the same. Okay, doesn't happen 
very often, but wanted to make sure I mentioned it. So then what about perpendicular lines? Well, perpendicular, hopefully you remember what those look like. Something like this, something like that. And they form not just one. Technically, there would be four. You could do them anywhere. Right angles. But again, it forms a right angle. That's what it means to be perpendicular. And what would that mean about their slopes? Well, hopefully you can definitely see that one would have to be positive and one would have to be negative. Again, this is barring any of those special circumstances that we talked about just a second ago. Obviously, if I put these two together, they also would be perpendicular, just like our X and Y axes are. So they wouldn't be one positive, one negative. But again, those are the special circumstances. We're talking about almost always otherwise. What is going to happen with their slopes? Well, again, one's going to have to be positive. One's going to have to be negative. So there's two things that you got to be aware of. They have to be opposites. And by they, I'm talking about the slope. And they also have to have their slopes be the reciprocal. Again, pertaining to their slope. And hopefully you remember reciprocal is if you have A over B, the reciprocal would be B over A. And in order for them to be perpendicular, one positive, well, then the other one would be negative or vice versa. Okay, these would be what are called perpendicular. Now, the y-intercepts don't really matter. It's all about the slopes. Okay, now, if you wanted to multiply those together, then you know that the a's would cancel and the b's would cancel, and we would just have a bunch of ones with a negative and a positive. So another way to check very quickly and easily is multiplying the two slopes to know that we get a negative one. I think it's easier to just know whatever one is, it's going to have to be the opposite reciprocal for the other. Okay, so let's wrap all this up with an example. And let's see if we can put it all together. If you want to pause it right here and try this before I go over it, more power to you. That's how you learn is by doing, not just watching. All right. Otherwise, let's go ahead and talk through this one, and then we'll move on to the next section. This one says a line passes through the points negative 2, negative 15, and 2, 3. So again, we could go and graph this and go left 2, down 15, all the way down here, and then over 2 and down 3 right here. And we're saying we got a line that goes through those. But then what they want us to do is find the equation of a perpendicular line that also passes through the point 6, 4. Because I could draw a perpendicular here, 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 wherever. So we need a point of reference. So they're saying somewhere over here, 6, 4, like there. This is the one that they want that goes through that point. Well, how am I gonna then find the equation of that line? You're not gonna do it graphically. Okay, we're gonna go back to our algebra roots. And I like this problem because it's very similar to what you guys will do in Calc 1. So let's walk us through the process. If we're gonna try to find an equation of a line, remember there's two of them that we talked about. There's the slope intercept, or the point slope. Either way, you can see we need to find the slope between those two points. So that's what I'm gonna start by doing. I'm gonna label this as an X and a Y, as it is, and this as an X and a Y. Now again, it doesn't matter which one you call your first or your second, that's irrelevant. 
because if you're finding the slope of a mountain, it doesn't matter if you start at the top or the bottom, the slope of that hill or mountain will not change. Okay, but in order to find the slope, I know it's the difference in my y's over the difference in my x's. And remember, got to be careful with this. Whatever one you start with here, you got to make sure you're consistent and also start with the x value there. So I'm going to go ahead and do the definition way. I'll do the y2 minus y1 to start. So a negative 3 and a negative 15. Now notice I've been putting these parentheses. And the reason I do that is for that right there. A lot of students I've seen over the years make the mistake of already seeing a negative, And so they don't do the actual difference or subtraction, which is by definition how we find the slope is the change in our two y values and the change in our two x values. So as precaution, I like to put parentheses around any time I'm inputting in place of variables. y2, y1. Now I got to do the x2 since I started with y2. There's my point, negative 3 and 2. And then x1. Again, there's that double negative, which we should know gives us a what? positive. So my slope is going to be negative 3 plus 15 over 2 plus 2, which is 12 over 4 or 3. Excellent. In calculus, you'll do a lot of work to find the slope of a tangent. But again, I need to know where that slope pertains to. And in this case, they wanted to know where it was perpendicular and going through the point 0.64. So if you notice, what we now have is a point that we're trying to give the equation of, and it crosses through, and a slope. But be careful. This slope came from these two points. We want the equation that's perpendicular to those. Meaning, as we just went over, if our slope was 3, we are going to put a new slope that is perpendicular to it of an opposite. Since this is positive, we'll take negative. And since this is 3 over 1, the reciprocal will be 1 over 3. So our perpendicular slope we now have is negative one third. And we have the point for the equation. So I will now take my point slope formula as a shell where the x1, y1, and m that I'm going to replace are now having the parentheses. And just as a warning, you know the slope, that's easy, is that negative one third that goes in front of the x. But where most students make mistakes with this is they'll put left to right order, the six here, the four there. And remember, the y's have to stay with the y's, the x's with the x's. So be careful with that. Notice that this is an x and that's my y. So the six goes with the x, the four with the y, and now all I have to do is simplify this by solving for the y. Just be careful when distributing. I have y minus four on one side, negative one third times x, and careful, a negative times a negative is going to be positive, and one third of six is two. So my final step for this would simply be to add four and get y equals negative one third x plus six. And that my friends is something that you will do constantly in Calc 1. But again, how we find the slope 
will actually require a little bit more work to be expected in calculus. All right, that's it for this section. I'll see you at the next one. Take care, everyone. Hey, it's Alan again. Well, section 4.2 is so short that I just kept this on the same video. So as you can see, it's just applications of what we just went over in 4.1, which is all of the lines, linear equations. So the notes are basically, here's a how-to generically on attacking word problems, right? So I'll just kind of step you through that. We'll do an example, call it good. Go practice, right? Now, again, applications usually means word problems, and a lot of students struggle with those. So I'm not brushing this off, saying that it's super easy, but it's something that you guys just need to work on. It's the only way you get better at it, okay? So first thing you want to do is read the problem, right? I like to read it in its entirety, so I kind of have a feel of what did they give me to work with, and what are they asking me to find? So that's where step one comes in identify the values that they both gave you and that they want you to find. For linear, input and output values. Then convert them to x comma y coordinate pairs. Find your slope, write the line. They're calling it modeling because it's gonna be real world situations. And then use that equation of a line to make predictions, evaluate, given some X value, find the output, okay? And then lastly, what if they did it in reverse? Can we give an X value if they gave us a Y value? Or can we find, I should say, an X value given a Y value, all right? And once you've done any and all of that, then just make sure you answer the question. Right? What did they ask us to actually find? So let's see if we can model this with an example. If we had a city's population and we knew it was growing linearly. Now, again, that's a key, right? That is linear in nature. And they say in the year 2008, that population was 28,200 people. And then Four years later, in 2012, it had grown to 36,800. And assuming that just based off of these four years, assuming that it continued that way, could we predict the population in 2014 or this year, 2022? And can we identify when we would reach 54,000. Maybe we need to rethink our structure or our sprawl, our growth. Maybe we need to go up instead of out. All different kinds of things that need to be considered depending on the job and the situation. Okay. So we got a few more things here that we need to contend with. 2008, that was the population. And in 2012, that was the population. So hopefully you can see an input and output, an input and output, two ordered pairs. Now the numbers are quite large, so this is where you can kind of get a little creative. And instead of saying in 2008, I could call that year zero. This is when I'm going to start. And then instead of putting and using 2008 and 2012, if this is my time at year zero, then this would just be four years later. So if you want to use zero and four, it's all good. Either way, just make sure that you're putting what you know, and that would be my order pairs. And I'm going to use the color coordination here so that you can see the two different ones. And I'm not using commas with the thousands because I want to make sure that you know that this is an ordered pair and not just one big, huge number. Okay, so before we can predict the population in 2014, pretty much all word problems, you want to take all of the information and write an equation. 
And since I have two points, I should be able to draw or excuse me, create an equation. Rather not draw because I still need to be able to predict and drawing is a little bit, for lack of a better term, sketch, right? It's not as exact, all right? So I will call this my X and my Y first and my second. And therefore I know right away I can find the slope of these things. Now, it's totally up to you if you wanted to rewrite it with the X and the Y flip-flopped. But think about what you're doing. What rate of change do you want? You probably want the population per year rather than the year per population. That doesn't really make sense. So think about which one you would want to be your input and your output as you set these up. Okay? Usually, I'll tell you right now, time is usually on bottom. Okay, miles per hour, feet per second. Right? All those types of things, typically time is on bottom. All right, so I will go ahead and start filling in what I know. And again, just be consistent. 36,800, I'm going to subtract the 28,200 from that. And then since I started with the 36, I'll have to do 2012, which is where that came from, and the 2008 for where the 28,000 came from. Now we do what it says. Find the difference of the top. I know there is a difference of 800 and 200, that's 600. And I know a difference of 36 and 28,000 happens to be, which would be eight. So we get 8,600 on top. I don't need a calculator for that, nor do I need it for 2012, 2008. Just count upwards rather than subtracting. That's a difference of four years. Now, again, I don't need a calculator because I can just simply divide the four into the eight. That gives me two. Divide the four into the six. That only goes in once. So I'd have two left over, and then I bring down the next thing. And I know four goes into 20 five times. And then the last zero, don't forget it would be that. So my slope or average rate of change would be 2,150. But what does that represent really? Remember, it was population over years, which means the population is definitely increasing. We saw that from year to year. But this now Instead of every four years knowing how much it increased by 8,600 people, we divided by four and saw that every year it was increasing by 2,150 people. So if I want to predict, I could just sit there and add this however many times until I got to that, but that's not going to help me for part B. So we're going to set up an equation. And if you remember, the way that we will do that is instead of y equals mx plus b, I have a point and a slope. So I will use point slope form. I definitely know my slope. That's the 2150. And you might be wondering, well, where's the point? There's actually two of them right here. So pick your favorite, pick the easiest. It's totally up to you. And like I mentioned, if you want to make this much simpler, you can take away the 2008 and the 2012 and just call this zero and this four because that would just give me the same thing. But these are easier to use for my X's. Just make sure that you know if this is the year 2014 and this was year zero, that's why we called this four. Then for this, we would have to plug in a six for our time or what we called X. So again, totally up to you on how you would do that. I would rather use zero, four, and six. So that's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to use the point 
zero for my x, 28, 200 for my y. And now I have an equation set up that I should be able to get into a better form, slope intercept form that is. When we subtract nothing, nothing happens. So we'll just have this on this side and I'll have to add this to the other. So my new equation will look like twenty one fifty x when I multiplied here, the zero again wouldn't do anything plus twenty eight thousand two hundred. So now that I have this set up, remember what we called the x. those were our times in years and then our y's was the population in people okay so if they want me to predict the population in the year 2014 remember i'm not going to use 2014 there i'm going to use what i used before which was a zero four and therefore in this one six now so i will go to this function and i will replace what I now know my x to be, and that would be a six. And again, I can do some multiplying pretty easily in my head without having to go and grab a calculator. You're more than welcome to, but I like to challenge you a little bit. So what would I have to do here? Well, six times zero is zero. Six times five is 30. Six times one, six plus the three would give me nine. And then six times two is 12. Pretty quick, faster than you can look for your calculator. Now I'm gonna add that 28,200 to that. And that will give me my output, which in this case was the population after the six years in 2014. Zero, zero, 11, that's 10 plus one, another 11. Two plus two is four. And remember, if you did it correctly, it should definitely be more than what we had before. Now we've grown to 41,100 people. in the year 2016. That was part A, sorry, 2014. It was six years after our starting time, 2008. Okay, lastly, part B, they want us to find the year now. Those were our X's, we called them, where the population, which were the Y's, we called it, would reach 54,000. We definitely know it's after 2014. So this time, 54,000 is what we're going to be plugging in for Y. Because they want the population to be that. So going back to my original equation that we had to do some work to find, I will say my Y is equal to 2150X plus 28,200. If you want to throw in the parentheses now, or the, excuse me, the commas now, then no problem because we're not dealing with the ordered pair coordinate anymore. So first step to solving this, pretty easy. You guys should know how to do this very simply by now. We'll subtract over the 28,200. Zero, zero, I'll have to do some borrowing here. So that's an eight, borrow again. 13 minus eight is five and two. So now I have 25,800 is equal to 2,150 X. And my last step to solving this problem would be to divide by that. That gives me the number of years after our original 2008 
All right, so my answer won't be what this X is because remember, we changed it to be easier values than those big old 2000 numbers, okay? And in order to do that, I'm gonna go ahead and simply divide by a 10 because if I do that, then I can just drop these zeros. And now I got 2580 divided by 215. And I know 215 goes into 258 one time. And it is a difference of four, three. Don't forget to bring down the zero. And hopefully you can see the 215 will go into 430. 200 and 400, that's twice. 15 and 30, that's twice. So it's twice. Again, don't just jump to your calculators. Most of the time, they're not necessary, but they do help to speed things up. And I know some of you are more comfortable with them. Okay. So don't forget, 12 is not our answer. Part B, we found it would be 12 years after the original measurement of the population. And so if we add 12 to that 2008, we get the year 2020. That's when the population would reach 54,000. Okay, so be careful because where can you go wrong in this problem? Everywhere. Pay attention to details. Make sure that you're setting it up correctly and then plugging in the proper things in the proper places. Otherwise, just practice. Make sure you read it slowly. Read the whole thing. Try to figure out what they gave you to work with and what they want you to find out. All right. That's it. Take care. Until next time, Alan signing off.